Welcome to the Green Parking Council webinar on cool pavement. This presentation is part of our continuing series of informational webinars on sustainable technologies and programs in parking facilities. I am Trevor Mead, Green Parking Council Staff Associate. If you encounter any technical problems during the presentation, please email Paul Wessel at paul at greenparkingcouncil.org or send a chat message in the box on the left-hand side of your screen. Dark man-made pavements account for over one-third of the surface area in most cities. These pavements absorb the sun's light very effectively, increasing air temperature in urban areas. During today's webinar, two experts from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory will describe parking's contribution to this temperature rise and how cool pavement applications can mitigate this impact. Additionally, these experts will share the supplemental benefits of applying a cool pavement technology in your parking lot. The Parking Services Manager of the City of Fort Lauderdale will conclude the presentation with a description of his experiences with cool pavement technology. Please enter any questions into the chat box located on the left-hand side of your screen. We have 15 minutes at the end of the webinar to go through the questions we received during the presentation. The webinar will last no longer than one hour. Without further ado, I would like to introduce today's two presenters from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Haley Gilbert is a Principal Research Associate with the He Island Group at the laboratory. She is leading the Cool Communities Project to provide and develop technical assistance and resources on the use of cool roofs and cool pavements in California. In addition, Ms. Gilbert is the liaison between the group's research staff and industrial partners, local government collaborators, and other stakeholder organizations. Prior to joining the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, she worked for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, coordinating green building and sustainability projects in New York and New Jersey. Haley is a lead accredited professional and holds a master's degree with a focus on environmental design from Yale University. Today's second presenter, Benjamin Mandel, is a research assistant with the He Island Group at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. In this role, he provides support on Cool Communities project efforts, including technical seminars and stakeholder meetings related to the adoption of cool pavements and services by California cities and schools. Mr. Mandel also provides research assistance to former California Energy Commissioner Dr. Arthur Rosenfeld in work including enhanced resilience to extreme heat events in U.S. cities and the use of cool roofs to improve indoor thermal comfort in India. Prior to joining the laboratory, Mr. Mandel worked as an assistant economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. He is pursuing a Master of Public Policy and an MS in Energy and Resources from the University of California at Berkeley and holds an A.B. in Mathematical Economics and an A.B. in Hispanic Literature and Culture from Brown University. Ben and Haley? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, perfect. So this is Haley Gilbert joining today from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory with my colleague, Ben Mandel. First and foremost, we'd love to thank the Green Parking Council, specifically Trevor and Paul, for working with us and also inviting us here today to present to you all. It's really exciting to kind of expand the reach of our cool pavement research to cool parking lots. So thank you again. Um, the Heat Island Group has been around for 20 plus years looking at cool surfaces. I think we're best known for a lot of our work on cool roofs, but we've also done a lot of research over the years on cool, cool pavements. I'd say more recently we've been able to focus again on cool pavements after a, a minor hiatus. Um, one thing to note is we not only kind of, we have a range of research that we perform, I'd say, on cool surfaces. You'll find out that we've done a lot to develop new materials for both cool roofs and cool pavements, helping companies to characterize the solar reflectance and the properties of the materials. We've also done a lot over the year to model the various benefits of cool surfaces, both at the individual project level as well as at the city level, and now even looking at the global level um, with climate change. The other thing that we often do is conduct field experiments 
So you'll see some of our projects are site specific where we get out and we actually perform measurements. Uh, and then lastly, we, we work with policymakers and stakeholders, especially in California, on implementation. So again, we'd love to encourage you all, if you have further questions um, on cool parking lots, please reach out to us. We are a resource and we love to connect with folks in the field to learn more about what kind of information would help you with implementing cool pavements, as well as what kind of barriers that you are incurring. So at this moment, I'm going to let Ben take the lead on the rest of the presentation, and I'll jump in at the end. All right. Well, thank you, Haley. Uh, my name is Ben Mandel, and I work with Haley at the Heat Island Group at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, thanks again to the Green Parking Council and Trevor for inviting us to speak this morning, and thank you all for joining us. So this morning we'll discuss what motivates our research, uh, specifically the use of cooler paved surfaces in cities which get very hot. We'll talk about some of the background science uh, that explains why surfaces can be cooler, and then what some of the benefits of using more reflective cooler surfaces in cities might be. We'll next walk, uh, walk over some of the options that are actually on the market today for uh, cool pavement solutions for parking lots. Um, we'll then look at some cool pavement um, parking lot case studies before going over some things to consider when um, working on your own project locally. And then later on we can touch on some frequently asked questions as well. So why do we do this research? Well, to put it simply, cities can be very hot. So here you see uh, two side-by-side -side images of the same exact plot of land in Sacramento, California. On the left you see a typical photograph, uh, much like you'd see from an airplane. And on the right you see the thermal photography version which shows how hot the surfaces are. And what you see is that there is a lot of orange and red which indicates very high surface temperatures. So we observe a phenomenon called the urban heat island which characterizes the fact that cities are often much hotter than the surrounding suburban and rural areas. So here you see a little schematic diagram that shows that downtown areas can be much hotter than their surroundings. And again, this is what we call the urban heat island effect, and that's what's given our group its name of the heat island group. But why are cities so hot? Well, one reason, in addition to a lot of um, human activity that produces waste heat, is that there are a lot of man-made surfaces. And these are typically impermeable and very dark in color. So you see from this pie chart that characterizes four major U.S. cities that over one-third of the urban surface area is comprised of dark pavements. Pavements are traditionally dark and made of um, black asphalt. So about a third of U.S. cities are pavements and of that third, we normally think of something like streets as being the largest chunk, but in fact they're only 45%. Another 15% is made up by sidewalks, which are usually lighter in color because they're made from cement concrete traditionally. But another 40%, and importantly for this uh, meeting, 40% is exposed parking lots, which are traditionally made from asphalt concrete. So 40% of about one-third means that exposed parking lots can actually constitute 10 to 15% of a city's total surface area, which is a big chunk. And we know that parking lots and pavements in general can get very hot. If you've ever been out on a very hot summer day in a parking lot maybe near the beach and tried to walk barefoot, you know that the black parts can get very hot and you'll probably try to walk on the white striping because it's a lot cooler. So this photograph, again a thermal image taken in Rio Verde, Arizona, shows that the dark paved surface is actually more than 30 degrees warmer than the, the nearby grass, which is a cool vegetated surface. So let's go over the basics of why these dark surfaces are actually much warmer in temperature and heat the air. It's actually these surfaces that warm the air rather than sunlight. A lot of people think that if the sun is shining, that it's the sun that's warming the air on a nice hot day, but it's actually opaque surfaces 
such as pavements and roofs, which absorb part of sunlight and reflect part that are actually heating the air. When a surface absorbs sunlight, it later re-radiates that energy in the form of heat, and that's what causes air to, to warm. So we like to use a measure called solar reflectance to describe how cool or reflective a surface is. And solar reflectance is just the fraction of sunlight that a surface reflects. So it's a ratio between the reflected sunlight off a surface and the sunlight that's coming on to the surface from the sky. And it's measured on a scale from 0 to 1, where 0 is a perfect absorber of sunlight, and 1 is a perfect reflector. So if we think about this in a pavement context, traditional asphalt concrete is usually about 5 to 10 percent reflective when it goes down. And it's very clean and nice and dark. Over time, as it picks up dirt, and actually the asphalt gets oxidized from the surface, this can actually increase to about 15% reflective. Cement concrete is lighter in color to start. It might be 30 to 35% reflective and then degrade over time as it gets dirty. And simply put, the more reflective a pavement surface is, the lower the pavement temperatures get. So here you see um, from several contexts, the, the relationship between solar reflectance and surface temperature. And you can see that as you increase solar reflectance by about 10 percent, you can actually decrease its surface temperature on the order of 7 degrees Fahrenheit. So it makes a big difference. And the cooler the surface is, the cooler the air around the surface will stay as well. So now that we understand a little bit more about why cool pavements stay cool and keep the air around them cooler, let's look at some of the other co-benefits that that can bring along. One nice advantage of cooler pavement surfaces is that they bring about a longer pavement life. If you think about a surface that absorbs less sunlight over time, it degrades more slowly. So here you see two different pavement systems compared, and um, on the top there's a hot surface that absorbs more sunlight and therefore ruts um, or degrades much more quickly with fewer repetitions to get to the failure criterion rut depth. The surface that only ever gets warm rather than hot is able to endure many more repetitions before it is determined to be failed. Another benefit is that if you have a lighter colored surface, it's better at reflecting any kind of light. It doesn't necessarily have to be from the sun. So you can think about the, light, uh, the nighttime illumination on a parking lot being better reflected from a lighter surface. This means that you'll have enhanced visibility at nighttime for your stores and patrons. A sort of corollary or alternative to that is that you can generate energy savings. Let's say you're pretty content with your current level of illumination at night. You can actually switch to a lighter colored pavement surface and decrease the amount of light that you need to provide to bring about the same amount of illumination. So it's sort of a trade-off. You can either have enhanced illumination at night or pay less on your lighting energy bills. You can also reduce energy bills by reducing the air temperatures, which also reduces energy demand for air conditioning um, in nearby buildings. An interesting study recently has shown that you can improve outdoor comfort as well just by implementing cool pavements on a large enough scale. A large park in, in urban Athens, Greece recently installed 4,500 square meters of cool pavement surface, and that reduced peak air temperatures by 2 degrees Celsius, which is about 4 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's appreciable, especially when you think about a heat wave like everyone on the East Coast is probably experiencing right now. Decreasing air temperatures by 4 degrees is nothing to sneeze at, and it can actually save lives in the event of a very extreme heat event. Another benefit is that it can preserve water quality. And this can actually protect some valuable ecosystems. If we think about stormwater runoff, this goes into streams and um, watersheds locally, 
and when it rains, the water heats up in accordance with how hot the pavement surfaces are. So the cooler the surfaces remain, the cooler the runoff is able to stay, and that will minimize the impact that the paved surfaces actually end up having on local aquatic ecosystems. And that'll help preserve some of our favorite species of fish. Finally, some other benefits are that there are reduced heat-related stress, such as in the event of a heat wave. There's improved air quality because lower air temperatures slow the formation of ground-level ozone, which is the primary component of smog. And it also can cancel out the warming effect of carbon dioxide. So by reflecting more sunlight from the surface of the Earth, there's actually less energy absorbed at Earth's surface. And this has the nice effect of essentially canceling out some of the warming from the carbon dioxide that's already present in the atmosphere. So if, if mo most of the world's hot and temperate cities were to convert to cool roofs and pavements, it could actually cancel out the warming from 44 billion tons of CO2 emissions. And that's about one and a half years worth of, of our current level of carbon dioxide emissions, or equivalent to taking half the world's cars off the road for about 20 years. So it's definitely something that merits our consideration. But furthermore, it can be translated into an economic benefit. So in a study of the potential for cool surfaces in Los Angeles conducted in 1998, um, the city was modeled with cooler, more reflective surfaces. So the solar reflectance of its pavements was modeled at 0.25, so 25% more reflective. And the combination of this with cooler roofs and also increased urban vegetation was found to reduce peak air temperatures by 3 degrees Celsius, or 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit, which reduced peak power demand by 1.6 gigawatts, so that's a billion watts, it reduced smog exceedance under the Clean Air Act by 12%, which, improved the he which would improve the health of the citizens. And that translates into an economic benefit attributable to cool pavements alone of about $91 million each year. So it's definitely something well worth consideration on scales both large and small to benefit your patrons and cities. And now I'm going to turn it back to Haley, who will discuss some, some options that are already on the market today. Great. Thank you, Ben. Uh, that was really helpful. It kind of casts the, the background on the science of cool pavements and some of the benefits. And I'm going to move into what you can find today on the market, how you can actually implement cool parking lots for your projects in your city. Um, here again, we're just going to touch on solar reflectance. You can see as Ben mentioned, new asphalt concrete has a range of solar reflectance between 5 and 10 percent. As it ages, it tends to lighten because the asphalt is actually oxidizing, so it can increase up to 15 percent depending on the solar reflectance of the aggregate or the rock that's exposed. Right? The exact kind of flip happens when we look at cement concrete. It's actually, when it's new, it's more reflective because it's, of course, lighter. And as it ages and soils with tire tread and oil, it actually darkens um, down to about 20 to 35 percent. And you'll find that a lot of these are ranges um, because things soil and age differently. Um, also, not all cement is created equally, and its variations in mix come out with uh, variations in solar reflectance. One thing to keep in mind is uh, when we talk about cool roofs, we often talk about white roofs. But when we talk about cool pavements, we're not expecting anyone to do white cool pavements. Really, the range of a new gray cement concrete, about 30 to 50 percent, is the range that we suggest to people when they think about cool pavement projects. Um, there is some glare issue if you have a white pavement, so we're you know, we're realistic. We're not expecting uh, everything to be painted white, as many people believe. So moving on, uh, here are some options when we're looking at AC pavements. I think many exposed parking lots are uh, constructed with asphalt concrete, 
Um, so one thing that you can do that's kind of just the first step into the cool range is, as I mentioned, use light-colored aggregates because as your parking lot ages and the asphalt oxidizes, more of that light-colored aggregate will be exposed. You can also see this when you're looking at chip seals, for example. If you use a light-colored chip on your chip seal, your pavement surface will actually have a higher solar reflectance. I know that when it comes to parking lots, is as the aggregate starts to be exposed, it, it also might mean that it's time for a surface treatment. So the next idea is the coolest, and that's to use reflective surface treatment. There are many types uh, that can kind of serve in the place of a traditional seal coat that go on top of your pavement system, so they help preserve the pavement system itself. In those range, again, depending on the material used, from about 25% reflective to 55%. Uh, when we're looking at cement, concrete, parking lots, and pavements, many kind of freestanding parking structures are constructed from cement, concrete. And those are actually pretty reflective in and of themselves. They're within the range that we might suggest with an initial solar reflectance of 30 to 40%. If you want to achieve an even more reflective surface, um, or you have other kind of environmental goals, you might think about incorporating slag into your cement mix, uh, which is a byproduct um, from the blast furnace. And that's actually really light and can increase the range of solar reflectance to 40 to 60 percent. As you can see in that picture, that runway is extremely light. Um, it's quite impressive. And it's using a, a waste product. And lastly, just some other ideas that many of you actually might already employ. We have permeable pavements or porous or pervious. There's many names for these. And again, they work when it rains and some of the moisture is captured within the pavement structure. The process of evaporation will cool the pavement as well as the local air. They don't work very well for cooling Northern California because we have our rains in the winter. Um, but in some areas, they work better. Also keep in mind, if it's extremely hot and muggy, very humid, uh, that will also slow the rate of evaporation. Another one that we see often is resin binders, which are kind of, instead of using the asphalt or cement to bind the aggregate, you can have a clear binder. Therefore, the pavement takes on the solar reflectance value of the aggregate. Um, which can be quite beautiful as you see in the picture. You have a lighter colored rock that kind of mimics uh, the colors seen in the landscape. I, I don't know if any of you all have used these, but the reinforced grass pavements that kind of work in the same way as permeable pavements. I think they also keep it cooler just because vegetation has evapotranspiration, but it's also more reflective than a dark asphalt uh, pavement. You also find these really popular where you have high demand traffic for a minimum amount of time. Uh, I don't think they're very good where you have a lot of people that might be wearing high heels. There might be some safety concerns, but other than that, I think they've been very effective. So moving on to some actual case studies, we're going to focus on parking lots and we're going to focus on surface treatments of parking lots and give you a snapshot of some of the technologies that people are using, materials technologies that people are using today. Uh, here we have a, it's a, actually a traditional seal coat, but it's been modified with a white pigment, GiO2, and acrylic, and therefore it's able to take on that tan color that you see in the after, after shot. So this is a little bit more than a traditional seal coat, but it performs in the same fashion as a seal coat. It's applied in the same way as a traditional seal coat, which makes it very appealing for projects. Next we have uh, Nanocrete by Emerald Cities. It's a cementitious coating. It's very thin. It operates on kind of the nano level of particles, so it's also very durable. These are two uh, parking lots in Phoenix, Arizona. I love the parking lot in the bottom because this is in the center of the city 
and a parking lot actually, by having it this green color, takes on the appearance of a park. So it's aesthetically very nice as well as thermally very nice for people to kind of walk across and park in. The next one we have here is called eCrete. It's another product. It's a polymer composite micro overlay. Uh, this product has been in the market for a very long time, and it's over time developed pretty good durability. So it might cost you a bit more, but the durability, we've seen it uh, used in places, the coating, the, the surface treatment will withstand up to 10 years of, of wear and tear. So compared to a traditional seal coat, this one has um, seems to outlast. And kind of the last uh, example that we have here is in our own facility at Berkeley Lab, we've developed a cool pavement showcase in conjunction with our facilities division. We had a brand new giant parking lot, and we found that to be a great opportunity to work with manufacturers to put down test plots of cool pavement sections. You can see we have various types of products, various colors. We invite the public, uh, various local government stakeholders, anyone that wants to come. If you're local, you're more than welcome to come visit to see some of these products literally on the ground. You can, uh, it's quite interesting to just feel the sensation of walking over the cool pavement sections versus the traditional dark asphalt, um, just the bottom of your shoes. Um, we're also measuring the solar reflectance of these pavements over time. Since they're close, it's much easier for us to kind of go out there and and monitor what happens to them with average uh, parking wear and tear. As Ben mentioned, uh, next we're going to jump into things to consider. We are not idealists. We don't want to paint everything white. I think cool pavements work for different projects, and you have to kind of analyze the pros and the cons when it comes to thinking about cool pavements and parking lots especially. One thing to keep in mind, as we've mentioned several times, the solar reflectance changes over time. So expectations you might have had at the beginning of the project, you might have to think about those within a couple of years to understand what the real benefits would be once these surfaces take on a more realistic solar reflectance. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention here, though, is there are new technologies. And I think Brian probably can touch on this a bit more, too, with his experience. There are new technologies that use cool pigments. So the pigments actually appear darker in color and can mask a bit more of the soiling that occurs on traditional cool pavements that actually reflect much of the invisible near-infrared sun, so have very high uh, solar reflectance values. Next, if you have any shading from buildings or cars or vegetation, that might not be the best cool pavement project uh, that you can identify. Uh, the shading is a, is a natural benefit, and it confers much of the same uh, kind of thermal comfort and city temperature reductions that we mentioned with cool pavements alone. Um, again, availability of materials. Here I just want to touch on, you know, we're doing a project in California at the moment to kind of look at this in a bit more detail. But we want to be sure that whatever kind of cool pavement products we use or how we import them aren't creating greater upstream environmental impacts. So one thing to keep in mind, especially with aggregate, if you're looking for a reflective aggregate, try to look in your own backyard instead of trying to import um, aggregate from very far. This is a great summary of kind of the things that I've already touched on, depending on where you are. What is your climate where you are? What is the exact location of your parking lot? As I mentioned, is it in the downtown area? Is it already shaded by trees? What are the goals of your project? The use, do you have full-time parking use? Is this a temporary parking lot? Your budget? All of these things come into play when electing to move forward with a cool parking lot and also maybe what material you might want to use in your parking lot. Um, the benefits and costs with cool pavements is a bit different uh, than cool roofs. With a cool roof, if you have less heat entering your building, 
you actually have less demand for air conditioning and the building owner directly benefits from a lower utility bill. With cool parking lots, for example, we've mentioned that you can uh, potentially reduce the need for street lighting, but a lot of those benefits that we also mentioned are conferred by the city, by your residents. So as the city thinks through cool pavements, we also need to keep in mind these other benefits that are much more difficult to monetize. Maybe it's the health uh, area or looking at thermal comfort. Those are sometimes harder to monetize. And then lastly, again, our work is supported by two state agencies in California. That's been our main support. And then also we've been able to partner with the U.S. Department of Energy that we'd like to thank um, all of them for helping support our research. At this time, I think we can turn it over to Brian to hear about his real-world experience in uh, Fort Lauderdale. Well, good afternoon or good morning for most of you. Uh, my name is Brian McElligot. I'm the Parking Services Manager uh, with the uh, Transportation and Mobility Department in the City of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I started with the city in uh, 2005 in Parking Services, and after a brief uh, hiatus in another department, came back uh, late last year in, uh, as the Parking Services Manager. One of the first things I was tasked with by our City Manager, Lee Feldman, was to look at exploring options for adding sustainable uh, components to our lots and our garages. I've been having very little knowledge of this myself. I've started doing a little research, and I found a link to the Green Parking Council. Uh, I initially began, began a dialogue with uh, Paul Wetzel, and uh, he told me that they've been working on a green garage certification program for about two years and, and really had not started looking at parking lots as of yet. After several other discussions, uh, he suggested that we meet with him and uh, Rachel Yoka, uh, who is with Tim Haas and Associates, also on the Green Parking Council, and uh, discuss uh, the, the, a possible project. Well, during our conversations over the next several weeks, I mentioned that the International Parking Institute was having their annual conference, and we were the host city, and the conference was to be held in May of 2013. And uh, I was also on the host committee for that conference. And we thought it would be a cool idea to introduce a number of sustainable initiatives to one of our city parking lots and to showcase it during the conference. Uh, we had several meetings. We had a meeting on site. We selected a, a uh, location, a small parking lot in the front of uh, our city hall. And um, we, at that time, we developed, started to develop an extensive list of sustainable uh, components that we could demonstrate in the lot. Now, the, the final list uh, included about 29 potential components. And we knew because of the size of the lots, we could not introduce all of them, but uh, we set about to determine what was possible. And also, we, at that point, we're under a very short time frame to, to get these in by the May uh, 2013 conference. By the way, the conference uh, had 4,500 attendees and vendors, and it was very successful um, and uh, definitely a boon for the city of Fort Lauderdale. Initially, one of the most important components was to find and install a solar reflective surface coating. Uh, we wanted a coating that would be attractive, that would be durable, and certainly reduce the heat island effect in an urban environment. Uh, in South Florida, especially, our asphalt light lots deteriorate quickly, quickly and are blistering hot to the touch. And after much research, uh, we sec selected a product for the demonstration, which was a Street Bond SR150. Uh, after doing a little research, uh, we found that the pavement surfaces are a leading cause of urban heat island effect, and you've heard that already. They contribute roughly 30 to 40 percent of the urban footprint. Uh, re reducing heat island effect uh, not only lowers energy consumption, but we can t potentially cut air conditioning bills up to 33 percent. Not to mention cooler pavements means safer, more comfortable pavements as well. The installation was a six-coat sprayed application. Uh, we took temperature readings immediately prior to the, uh, the installation. And uh, we posted in the early morning, um, sunny day, uh, about 104 degrees on the surface. After two days of installation on a very, very similar day, uh, the, the temperature surface was about 91 degrees. Uh, 
And of course, because the surface is solar reflective, it reduces the amount of heat absorbed during the day and, co and consequently released during the night, which is a very important uh, component, and, and you've heard it, of course, uh, before from uh, Haley and Ben. Now, uh, we, as Haley mentioned, many um, lots are not conducive to having a surface coating. We have many lots within the city of Fort Lauderdale that have a significant tree canopy. Uh, and just adjacent to this lot that we tested, we uh, had in previously installed a pervious pavement test. Uh, pervious pavement paving allows for stormwater to naturally filter through the surface, the base and the subbase, and also absorb far less heat than traditional asphalt surfaces. We are currently working with a vendor now to do a test with, with interlocking concrete uh, uh, installation. And of course, again, one of the most important components of that is to properly prepare the base and the sub-base and the aggregate uh, that's involved there. Um, we did also in, uh, install a tr number of other components, which I w is not part of this conversation, but I would wish to go through it pretty quickly. Uh, of course, we wanted to be adjacent to, uh, com immediately adjacent to mass transit, and this lot's a block and a half from the, the uh, county bus hub. Uh, we had uh, electric vehicles in the lot. We had electric cars. We had electric uh, bus. We had a variety of uh, EV charging stations. And subsequently, we've purchased four uh, EV charging stations to in install in our lots with four wind turbines to power those stations. We did a demonstration of the bike sharing program. The city has 18 B-cycle locations throughout the city. And if you wish to learn more about that, I'd be happy to respond to any in email inquiry. Uh, because we were on a short deadline, we replaced our 100-watt high-intensity fixtures with 70-watt um, induction lighting with no uh, reduction in the amount of lighting in the lot. And of course, my personal favorite is our parklet demonstration. The parklet is in an urban island made of wood, metal, or composite construction that typically replaces two or three uh, uh, on-street parking stalls. The design is primarily for low-speed downtown entertainment districts, and the parklet would have tears and tears and uh, tables. Um, so I really couldn't, if anybody has any questions about the other components we installed, I, again, I'd be happy to, uh, to go through that uh, through email or you can call me. And I believe that concludes my presentation. Thanks, Brian. We'll, we'll take some time to go through some, some questions now. Um, first is, based, based on your experience with the cool pavement, you mentioned that there was um, and this is for Brian, that there was a number of lots that had a canopy over it, um, vegetation, so the cool pavement application didn't make sense. Are there other lots that you're looking, looking at applying a cool pavement coating to? Absolutely. We absolutely, actually have a number of uh, very large uh, lots directly on the beach. Uh, one of them is right off the beach, and the other is, is like a half a block from the beach. Uh, one lot is uh, five, 438 spaces, the other lot is about 390 direct um, sunlight all day long, very little to no um, trees in these, in these beach lots because of the sand. So those, we think, would show tr uh, tremendous impact from the solar reflective uh, coating. And, and that leads me to another, another question for Ben and Haley. Does being close to the beach, salt water, play an impact on the durability of the cool pavement coatings, being maybe in the, in the north during the winter time? Um, does plowing or the salt salt on the plot play a role? Um, well, it's it's a very interesting question, and it does get into some of the differences in types of cool pavement. Um, I have not heard of any of the the salting or sanding or plowing being an issue with some of the cool pavement coatings that we've worked with. However, I have heard stories just anecdotally about uh, permeable pavement systems being sort of clogged up by some of the salt or, or sand that's used um, to melt snow in the winter time. So that is definitely a consideration when installing permeable pavements, but I don't believe it should have much of an effect uh, for coatings or some other impermeable cool pavement solutions. And, and I'll just add to that. Uh, cool pavements, it's definitely dependent on the material. Uh, I know that they're already used in Chicago, which readily use <laughs> salts and, and scraping. They're also used in Salt Lake right now. They're used in Tennessee where they have different, you know, in each city, in each state, they have different methods for clearing snow. But 
there's been many cities that have considered that. And one thing that you find, kind of like what Brian discussed, is um, they were able to test the section, test it through the winter, and find that it was very durable to um, the maintenance of streets for snow. And the next year they came back and are putting down a lot more of the cool coating. And I can, I can tell you from uh, experience uh, in the city since 2005, we've had a number of uh, direct hits and near misses with hurricanes, um, and our beach parking lots have had as much as a foot to, to three foot of, of sand in the lots after those events. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, and with the permeable pavement, if stormwater runoff's a, a, a concern, is there a situation where um, cool pavement coating wouldn't make sense, and can cool pavement coatings be integrated with permeable pavement? Well, Who's I that question for? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm happy to take that. Um, I think permeable pavement are, defi are definitely a good solution in a situation where climate allows. Um, I know Haley mentioned that these are well-suited for hot, rainy climates um, because there's a lot of water that can actually cool the air. Um, so they effectively do sequester stormwater to either the groundwater or to stormwater management infrastructure. So that can be definitely beneficial if you use permeable pavement. I think, however, that they can't really be integrated with a cool pavement coating because pavement coatings go over the, the surface of existing paved surfaces. And so they effectively seal them off. And when cool pavement coatings are most effective is when they seal them in best. Um, and that's, that's how they maintain the best performance and, and structure and durability. And I, and I think this is Brian again. I, I, I believe that the perm, uh, pervious pavements uh, also absorb less heat and, and consequently reduce less heat. So it works to, to, to almost the same effect as the solar reflectance. Yeah, the, the last thing I'll just add is you do find systems that have both the, the permeable property and the reflective property. You find a lot of the uh, cement uh, interlocking blocks, maybe Brian's actually using. Are actually, that's, we're, test, we're going to be testing that very shortly. Right, so it's actually a very reflective surface already, but it's also permeable because they're, they're interlocking blocks, so they allow the water to permeate through the, uh, the cracks within the blocks. So that's you know, you do find them sometimes paired together. We've got a question that came in here. Have you at the National Lab installed a cement concrete pavement testing pad? And how does that compare to the cool pavement coatings if you've done so, or is this something that you've considered if you haven't? I would say um, our showcase at the lab is looking at an existing parking lot. So we're looking at easy technologies that can go over an existing parking lot. We do actually have uh, cement concrete parking lots adjacent to this parking lot that we that have been there for forever that we are evaluating their solar reflectance as well. But our aim with the parking lot showcase is to look at surface treatments. We did consider looking at a an overlay, but we would have to mill out part of the pavement system, and that wasn't necessarily looked upon as a favorable idea by our facilities folks that just, just constructed the parking lot. So we've kind of limited our technologies there to ones that go on top of the existing pavement system. And has there been any studies done on the payback period based on the residual benefits of applying a cool pavement coating? And are there numbers or a range of what it costs per square foot to apply a, a cool pavement coating, including insulation and the actual material? Well, there are definitely, um, the payback period is a, definitely a popular and very fair question to ask um, because there generally is a cost premium to installing um, a surface treatment on an existing lot or choosing a cool pavement for a new lot. Um, we find that it's very difficult actually to quantify all of the benefits and to monetize all of the benefits of cool pavements. So it's very difficult to conduct a full, um, what we call life cycle cost assessment. 
and that would tell you what the true payback time is when you can take into account all of the many benefits. Taking into account just expected service life, and, and hopefully if you use an, a, a cool surface, it should be more durable and you'll need to replace it um, not as quickly as if you use just a traditional asphalt seal coat. Um, but there is a price premium that could range from a dollar per square foot up to um, seven or eight dollars per square foot depending on the type of product that you choose. And so it's definitely a consideration when you're, when you're doing your planning and you have to weigh the public health benefits and think about what types of energy benefits you can um, enjoy as well and that will help determine um, perhaps how much of a, of a premium product you can afford. In, in terms of the, the process of applying the coating, how long does it take? And is there is it a yearly process where you need to recoat the, the lot? Do you want to take that one, Brian? Sure, yeah. I can take that. We, when we had the uh, S, S Street Bond product installed, it took uh, uh, almost two full days. It's, a, like I said, a six-coat application. Uh, they had to spray a coat. Uh, there had to be a certain uh, amount of, of drying time, and then they applied another coat. Uh, so um, it, it was about two full days, which uh, I don't believe is extraordinarily long like the time for an application like this. I would also say that it depends on your material. I think the traditional seal coat is applied just like a seal coat. So it actually goes on pretty fast and it has to dry pretty fast because sometimes they're applied in parking lots with high demand, and if you close them, there's, that's a constant problem. Well, that absolutely, and that was part of the reason that uh, it took full, two full days because we had to do a portion of the lot and keep a portion of the lot open and, and you know, then do the other part, part of the lot. Okay, yeah. Also, if I can address, there was a question about the cost, and I, I believe uh, it was mentioned that the cost was uh, for, depending on the quality of the product, was anywhere from a dollar to seven dollars per square foot. And we we, uh, we installed this in a ten thousand square foot uh, parking lot, and our cost is a uh, little over three dollars per square foot. And are there benefits to applying cool coatings in a? In, um, in an area that has four different seasons throughout the year, and are there benefits in the wintertime to applying these coatings? Well, that's, that's another question that we get asked a lot, because certainly there is a benefit in, in colder climates to absorbing the most sun that you can in the, in the cold winter time. Um, however, we find that, um, and this is also true in the roof context, and we've done some studies on that, the, the, the heating season in the winter is often much shorter in most of the country than the cooling season in the summer. And the sun is lower in the sky in the winter, and a lot of the time in a cold climate, your surfaces, whether they're roofs or pavements, are covered in snow anyhow. And so for a variety of reasons, the winter heating penalty that you would feel, um, whether just thermally or in terms of your energy bill, is often a lot smaller than the summer heating benefit. I'm sorry, the summer cooling benefit. So um, we found that in all but the very most northern climates in the U.S., it actually pays to adopt cool surfaces. Now, depending on your latitude and climate, that could dictate exactly how cool you strive to go. Maybe somewhere in Florida or Arizona, it makes sense to uh, embrace the very most reflective surfaces but not so much in an area like in the Midwest or uh, Pacific Northwest, something like that. And, and I would agree on that. I mean, it, living in South Florida, where we uh, have a winter season that lasts a day and a half and gets down to a frigid 40 degrees for that day and a half, and the rest of the time is summer, uh, it makes more sense to have a more reflective surface. And we've got a question here regarding concrete. In terms of solar reflectance, is there a benefit to choosing a catalytic concrete product versus a standard cast gray concrete sub substrate? I'd say there's, there's new research coming out on the catalytic concrete. I think it's actually being used in a, pro a highway project 
maybe in Missouri or somewhere. Um, yeah, it's in Missouri. It's Missouri. And so there's some really interesting current research on using, I would say, photocatalytic um, concrete. It's actually, we intended to do a, a field experiment using it to see if its self-cleaning properties actually helped maintain high solar reflectance on pavements. Uh, but there's actually been some studies just recently that we found of a field experiment in Scotland then. Is it Scotland? Well, uh, it's somewhere I'm in Europe. I'm not sure where in Europe. <laughs> somewhere in Europe actually laid down a test section and um, were, performs uh, evaluations of air quality. Uh, photocatalytic cement uh, has the ability to kind of also clean the air. And they found pretty significant reductions in uh, NOx in the in the streets that the photocatalytic uh, cement was used. Yeah, so that was that was in the Netherlands actually. Just Netherlands. To back up, um, and Haley brings up a good point about the the highway demonstration in in Missouri, or the the test section, um, and I think that's part of a research project out of Iowa State and. Um, I was at a presentation given by one of the investigators a few months ago, and um, I think they were finding, you know, that in the early going, uh, once that product is put down, there's definitely an air quality benefit, and it definitely decreases the, the concentrations of nitrous oxide in the air at, you know, low elevations. But I think they were finding some sort of a mysterious um, film or um, calcification on the surface. Uh, of the catalytic cement that was actually inhibiting its effectiveness going forward. So um, I think they were going back to the lab to, to investigate further why that could be happening. So it seems like it's a promising technology, um, but it's still a little bit uh, of a ways away to justify on a wide scale right now. Thanks. And one final question is, What's the size of the market penetration so far with cool pavement? Is there, is there any numbers on the number of lots or the percentage of parking lots and facilities that have adopted cool pavement? I certainly don't know of anything offhand. Um, so a few thoughts. One is that um, plenty of parking lots out there, while, while they're traditionally using asphalt concrete, many use cement concrete. and those are two very traditional paving technologies that wouldn't be registered as cool pavement per se, even though in the case of cement they, they typically are. So I think that there is already a large market share, um, even though it's still dominated by asphalt. And the second thought is that this has been an area of slow penetration for cool surfaces. With cool roofs, we've seen a lot of progress in building codes and standards in not only California, which has sort of taken on leadership, but also in areas like New York City, Chicago, and parts of Florida, I believe, too, they've included cool roof requirements in building energy codes. And that has sort of led the way for a bit of market penetration for cool roof products. And while programs like LEED, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design from the U.S. Green Building Council, and other voluntary programs do award points for the use of cool pavements. There just isn't a lot of development in, with respect to uh, building and construction codes right now for cool pavement. So I think the, the policy side actually needs to take on a bit more leadership in order for us to see a little more market penetration. Thanks, Ben. Before we conclude the presentation, I'd just like to take a moment to thank Ben, Haley, and Brian for, for contributing to this presentation today and sharing information on the benefits of cool pavement and how the parking industry can really play a critical role in eliminating the heat island effect in cities across the country. As of tomorrow morning, the presentation as well as our panelists' contact information will be available on the Green Parking Council website. If you have any additional questions, I encourage you to reach out to Haley, Ben, or Brian uh, via email and ask them those. And if you have any suggestions for future webinars, please email me at trevor at greenparkingcouncil.org. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs>